All right. Uh, let's go to the next topic, the police laws. I would say, from what I've read so far, soon your nose is not fitting for me, you should go to jail. We had this time, I remember it, when I was young, there was this wall that came down and it kind of looked like that behind that wall. I don't know if I want to go back to that. That's why I'm super excited why Marie Brackling and Constanze Kurz, both journalists from Netzpolitik.org, are going to talk about the police laws of Germany to you tonight. Big round of applause for the two of them. Well, thank you, Mirko. We're thinking uh, if we should switch to French and do this in French, but I think we're going to continue in German. We are uh, happy and are looking forward, and we're super interested in all of you showing up. Um, and uh, most of you that are German uh, who are sitting here are affected. Uh, we would like to talk what is in these police laws, what are the most debated ones and the most questionable um, things that are going to be implemented. We want to talk about the protests and uh, the way that it's supposed to be for a proper talk on this. We have a few demands at the end that hopefully overlap with your wishes after the talk and hopefully we'll find some common grounds. We do find the development quite concerning over the that we saw over the past year. And we, why do we want to talk about this? There was a few things, we had a few points of, of touch with this. Uh, we, we wrote about these things. You can read those articles on netspolitik.org. That's not just the two of us, but also other members from the editorial staff. We were invited as experts in uh, different uh, German counties. Uh, there was different teams of the CCC that sent out uh, written expert statements. And we want to talk a little bit about how the process of that is as well. That was important to us. We want to start now with the question of protests. Uh, we would like to start with the positive and then move forward to uh, the more and more uh, mean measurements. I think we had a bit of luck this year because in Bavaria, um, as we know, there was a county election that led to um, protests being a little bit more widespread. Um, as you can see, we were quite surprised um, how many protesters actually showed up for the demonstration and that the um, politicians are reacting to all these protesters and this mass of protesters showing up, they had to react. This is obviously not the first police law um, in uh, the federal state of Hesse. Um, there was already one before, um, but the protests that um, were recognized beyond the county state, not just in Bavaria, and they were quite big, and, and I do think that the, the county election, like the, the uh, electoral vote was, was definitely helped. And uh, there was obviously different posters that were quite amusing. Um, yeah, so the protest was quite big. It was quite the largest protest Bavaria had seen in years. Um, there was one day in Munich where 40,000 people took it to the street. That's in Berlin dimensions, you know, but in Bavaria, these are quite, it's quite unheard of. And I would like to say, and um, we had a few allies that were quite um, surprising. I mean, it was a very, it wasn't just a big protest. It was a quite diverse protest that was very mentionable within Bavaria. It was all parties except for the CSU. Um, it was uh, unions that took part in this. Um, even the police unions uh, le let out critical statements, which is quite uncommon. Um, especially Jörg Radek, uh, who is uh, part of the um, the head of the uh, the the police union now is quite surprising, and there was there was other protesters that joined down the line that were quite foreign and strange to me. Like I have very little to do with the football scene and the soccer scene. Um, there was like 
very well organized uh, soccer clubs that joined the protest also on the street, not just in the stadium, uh, especially in Hanover, Hanover and, and Lower Saxony, um, was quite surprised by they had like the same shirts, they could sing quite well. Um, the only maybe disadvantage was only males, but it actually uh, proved to be quite uh, striking and, and they were quite vocal. And I mean, obviously, they're quite affected. She uh, made a word game on the word of punchline that I couldn't really translate into English in this, on the spot. Um, so um, the beautiful thing was that all of this was so positive and like so peaceful and everybody was kind of waiting for an escalation to take place. Um, so let's go back. Um, to Bavaria, because I'd like to go back to um, how politicians reacted to these large protests taking place. And we have an original um, representatives, Joachim Herrmann, the Minister of the Interior in Bavaria, that explained to us in the past, oh, I mean, maybe the title of the, of the slide is quite telling, uh, why people are taking it to the, the streets. Lügen propaganda is uh, lie propaganda, and it's, yeah. I'm gonna try, try this again. Can we hear anything? I have the voice on, it should be working. I'm trying to turn up the volume. No, it's just an idea, it's just thought. It's not working. I'm gonna try to do this, all right. But you can see there's like a, a thing. Still no sound from stage. Could I uh, get a little hint? Because uh, we tested this and the, the plug for the audio is plugged in and again? Oh, I don't know if it's running. I have another idea. I'm just going to try it here. There's now a bunch of uh, yelled advice from the audience. Ah, oh, the technician is informed. Help is coming. Also, just um, the title of the slide is one of those famous German compound nouns that is very diff notoriously difficult to translate. In the evening, we only do this as an extra entertainment aspect to uh, us presenting at this point of the night. Okay, we're going to go back so that you can hear what the important minister, the minister of... Good morning. Good morning, and were you surprised how many people took to the streets against your law? Oh, yes, of course. It was a quite uh, impressive number, and it was more than were expected to show up, and you have to take this seriously. But I am beyond all baffled that they kind of took, jumped on this bandwagon of lie propaganda and were led astray. Well, what we can see, obviously, the, the reasons for the protests were the lie propaganda. And I mean, we have to say, add here that on netspolitik.org, we actually reported on this. And it was quite upset by what he said in that interview. And I actually wrote two debunk articles about what he said in the interview, but he never got back to me on that. Um, I mean, most of you know the, the final results in Bavaria. Uh, before the elections, you didn't have to uh, come to a uh, consensus with the coalition. Um, so Marie found a really good title um, that the, the law, the police law in Bavaria um, is, in this extent, is, is not 
uh, seen since 1945, basically, the change in the law and this kind of uh, widening of the law. And like in any other county in Germany, that was not uh, uh, to this extent. I would want to talk about now what are the most, and especially judiciary, like uh, measurements and the most extensive ones. We don't want to talk about everything. We want to talk the ones that are being disputed right now. And I mean, the central point, and everybody who's read about this, is the uh, person, uh, the, the, um, the endangerer. So um, as a non-lawyer and a non-judiciary person, you, you can leave this aside kind of, but you have to look at the thought and the idea that's behind this, the idea of the endangerer that we have people, that we have people that themselves have done anything yet, they haven't committed any crime, they are also, they're not even shortly before the actual crime. But I have a person where I have two assumptions. One, that they want to do and commit a crime and that they are capable of doing and committing this crime. And the when and where of this actual crime is completely unknown to me. And this person I would like to um, I would like to, uh, I have like this, this, so that I, this measurements that I can apply to them now. So there's, because I have a suspicion, there is things such as surveillance, um, finding out more about this person, and Bavaria was the very first county to do so, um, to um, take measurements that are actually quite invasive, things such as electronic anchor bracelets. It's basically like um, continuously locating somebody's and uh, having uh, all times like loca localizing uh, device. I mean, at this point, I don't even know what that person is going to do and where they're going to do it. And now they're continuously uh, controlling somebody's location. and. Um, there's a lot of lawyers who actually said, well, how am I supposed to help prevent something if I don't even know where something's going to happen? Like, when are you going to, how are you going to justify um, taking somebody into custody, for example? I think there's two things that we have to dis distinguish, like in this sense, in this case, the, the sense of this um, ankle bracelet, this electronic monitoring. Like, for example, if you're out on, if you're, if you're um, let out of jail, early and you're an early release, that's completely different. This is um, potential in danger, it's like potential threats. Um, and the case, like the judiciary case that we have in this context, um, like our common sense, like what's coming and facing us now is what's threatening is a threat that hasn't even materialized yet. So you have to separate these two things. And when it comes to electronic ankle monitoring, um, we were writing about um, all sorts of experts that were releasing statements and were looking at these cases, these cases where there was actual attacks and there was attacks by people who were wearing these ankle bracelets. So actually the practicality of this practice is something that you have to really question. And I mean, obviously there was also technical problems that they did. They didn't even have, um, they don't even have proper laws on how this data is protected. Like this data that's collected, how is that actually securely stored? So there was a lot of stuff that was done wrong on a technical level of this. Like, the fact that somebody who is not materializing to be an actual threat, uh, but you're tracking and localizing them constantly is, is quite disturbing. Uh, we brought a few examples. Um, we want to um, want to uh, refer um, to uh, things that we've said in the past. Like you can 
publicly av find these available either on CCC or at NetsPolitik.org. Uh, most uh, committees of the interior um, are um, usually quoting experts and this there's uh, statements that um, basically uh, trace back to refer back to constitutional law. Uh, we always have to remember that we are not talking about people who actually made themselves conspicuous of committing a crime. We're not talking about people who are an actual threat. Um, they so that have to be stopped in the act of committing a crime. Yet these people are being um, robbed from their freedom for quite some time. So people who are basically labeled as a potential threat, like we're kind of moving in this thing called preventive custody. That means that somebody who's committed nothing close to a crime but could potentially in the future be willing to commit a crime and is capable of doing so we can take them into custody and like this is the most drastic measurement that a state has and to this day um, this was something that was usually between two, two to four days in most uh, most counties but it was in a very long period of time and now when we are talking about the novelization of novelization of the of the new police laws we're talking two weeks four weeks in Bavaria even three months these are completely new dimensions like a little anecdote maybe from uh, northern Westphalia uh, I was an expert on a committee there where the CDU and the SPD were having a debate on whether or not that person should be allowed to have a lawyer if you're put into custody for a month. And the SPD was um, was definitely demanding that for somebody being put in that position. But the counter argument in this case may be plausible was, but why? Why would you would that be necessary? Why would, you, would it be necessary to give them a lawyer? We're not actually um, We're not actually accusing them of any crime. So there's two things that we can maybe also say beforehand. Um, the police law in Northern Westphalia, um, they allow for a lawyer to be consulted. Uh, and that actually got in, instated in the mid-December. And the SPD um, in the opposition in that country uh, actually took this as something to be like their shiny little star that they pushed for that to be put into the into the law, which is kind of a common uh, right you should be having. Um, there is, in the beginning, there was some things that we want to talk about also about patterns of police law, like in the, within the coalition treaty, contract like from from the current German government from the black black red coalition this pattern sample or model police law there's a lot of differences so this So within the coalition contract, there's different, apparently different zones of um, police law. Um, and that's something that you can read up on, but it's always claimed. We say we have different zones of right and law. I can quote from the uh, coalition contract. We do not want different zones of different levels of security. And this is why we need to uh, aim for a model of the police law and if you look at it more closely and then you look at the aspect that's more preventive just lock somebody up like that uh, those are kind of the most significant differences on the different county levels um, but we want to talk about this a bit further there's another thought that we have also from Northern Westphalia from Jörg Enuschat who was uh, in the first hearing of the interior uh, committee and he introduces an interesting thought. Um, there's a lot of interesting uh, thoughts from experts in these committees actually. 
on how to do this better and how to execute this better. So Jörg Enerstedt says, what happens if afterwards it is proven that this person was not even a potential threat based on um, rights of reimbursement um, and how you could um, um, this could be something that you could um, you could use as preventive measurements from taking people into custody too easily and too lightly. Um, so if you take somebody into custody, so compensation. So basically introduce better measurements of compensation for when you throw somebody into uh, this kind of custody without actually having grounds for them being a potential threat. So it's obviously a surprise to no one that there is another measurement that is um, newly added to the law. There's different forms of the state's Trojan horse, um, which we captured in the wild in this image. I don't really want to talk about this too extensively because I think the CCC is working on this for the past 10 years. There's two... Um, two actual um, verdicts on this uh, from Karlsruhe um, and um, in this discussion in the center in the statements of the CCC you can find this all the time the changed situation of the IT security and the IT crisis of, of trust that we're having right now um, and I mean this is obviously something that we can is mainly due to the Snowden years. So the commercial uh, state Trojans are obviously um, actually blackmailing and extorting the government. And um, I also would like to remind of the legislative period before that one the state Trojan horse was something that was written into the criminal procedural code. Um, so we have something that was, there's constitutional complaints that were filed, four of them for this. Um, and they, they, there's four counties now that obviously are not paying attention to any of this, and it's kind of like this discussion never happened. And it's it's the scenes that happened in Northern Westphalia and Lower Saxony, the two through the two of us, and you have politicians in these um, county parliaments, and and they've never heard of this debate, and they literally their debate is literally fed by American television shows. And I mean, like at this, I have to tell this one s story, this one scene, and it's it's just quite telling of of of, of the level of knowledge. And it's a scene of with Doris Schröder Kopf. She's uh, part of the SPD party in, in Lower Saxony, and she was making suggestions that were I was making suggestions that were new because I wanted to see the reaction of parliamentarians. So um, I was trying to introduce. I was saying that maybe some machines should be excluded from this uh, state Trojan horse. Um, maybe like medical th machines should be um, saved and excluded. And on a judiciary level, you should be thinking about how in a law you could shape this and form this. How can you uh, prevent health and life being threatened from this? And I kind of talked about WannaCry. And I mean, obviously, there was quite a few hospitals that were affected by this, and there was no limitations on what a system is. And then Doris Schröderkopf looked at me and she said, "Well, yes, Frau Kurz, Mrs. Kurz. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if we do this, then the criminals can take exactly these machines." Well, um, think about what you just said, like what she just said there, a. Eh? Her thought process is with the state Trojan horse, you can hack all machines. It's, it's kind of like a cheap movie f from Hollywood. Like she has no idea what's, what can German 
governments and government offices actually hack and do and like the idea that they can hack everything and if we limit this from a law level that would also be the technical limitation and she I was telling her about like different operating systems and for what um, like so so for what operating systems this Trojan horse was supposed to be hacking for um, so what's uh, in the in the official uh, description of uh, the people who are then writing the code base for this um, and I mean and also what these uh, governmental institutions can pay for basically and I mean like the in the heads of the people on the of the deciders I mean I'm not talking about this one politician I'm, I'm talking about the the concept and like the the politicians and, and, and like their idea of this and their understanding of this and the limitations of these. Like for 10 years we've been talking what hacking is in a state context and then we get to this stage and, and you think that it's like black magic and naya, I mean you guys know. Uh, all right, so I think we should leave the state Trojan horse aside because there's lots to talk about this but we don't really want to do it right now. Uh, we've we've tried to kind of limit the the points of argument here, and there were none. I mean, maybe we should at this point mention. Yeah, no, we don't have time. We have to go to the next aspect. We have other technical measurements that are quite disputed. Uh, for example, the general uh, video surveillance. We can't really do it in the classic sense anymore. Uh, we have to talk about it in the sense where um, we have a biometric measurement aspect to this. Um, it's, I mean, this is something that they don't really ever distinguish. They blend the two together, which are quali like qualitatively quite different. But I mean, we had a bit of help. I mean, video surveillance per se is something that's researched quite well. And uh, especially in lower Saxony, there was uh, results from these studies that were that was showing uh, that the argumentative line for video surveillance, um, but I mean honestly, without uh, uh, without um, actually having two degrees, um, I, I can know and come to the conclusion that a camera is not going to jump between a perpetrator and its victim. Um, I think um, a lot of experts that empirically research this uh, were usually talking about what uh, video surveillance actually um, does. And uh, so that was not really our focal point, but what came became very clear and what became very clear to me is that in this discussion that um, with all these police laws, uh, they, they call it intelligent video surveillance. What they mean is anomaly detection or biological, um, biometrical measurement and detection. Um, I mean, this is obviously an aspect that we have to watch out for. There's, uh, there's a, a little point in brackets here. Um, generally, all of this is always done under the protection against terrorism. Um, so uh, there's a couple of opposition uh, party members who uh, actually also... Uh, oh, this was right after the attack in Strasbourg uh, with uh, weapons and um, the okay so the Habit Royal is the Minister of the Interior and he stands up and he's like you're not really allowed to say this but he directly links uh, the the passing of this law to to this attack and um, and then I mean like then he then jumps to pedophile stalkers and uh, all sorts of other criminals and I mean this is usually the point of arguments that are used to push these laws through and I mean like our point was usually always that the argumentative line was always um, the current state of threat that we're living in and to be honest if we're looking at this uh, this is not something that can be proven out of uh, facts and reality um, continuously all the German uh, federal countries are passing new police laws, and there was, and and there was within the constitutional court there was a change in the law, and that affected uh, all the different police laws. And um, so, I mean, there's no proof in the circumstances of threat and the level of threat that's risen, or that there's more of it now. 
in the current time. And I mean, like the, the usual claim is that uh, these terroristic attacks could be prevented if only our police laws were a bit more strict and were um, capable to be um, more um, elaborate in what they can do and who they can surveil. Okay, we're gonna try to play another audio here. Bear with us, let's see. I'm going to try this again. Matthias Becker is also a student of law. I do believe that the area that we have, um, so that um, a lot of actions that are done before the actual terroristic attack, um, we have quite extensive laws. So we should maybe uh, critically uh, evaluate our current actions based on the current laws that we have in place and we should maybe look at and evaluate how they're being put in place before introducing new ones. So it's not quite clear to me how many of you remember this was in June but that's also when the first aspects of the um, parliamentary inquiries into Anis Amri and his attack on the Berlin Christmas market two years ago all of these things were coming out around the same time and and it was very clear at the time that um, the police actually would have had the ability and um, the right to look into a lot of these things um, but they simply didn't use these insights and they didn't actually use um, the rights that they had to capture an actual endangerer, um, quote unquote, despite all these undercover cops being around him. So you can't just give uh, all these agencies more rights, right? Because with the existing rights that they have, they could have already prevented that. But I think we should make very clear that we also haven't heard from anyone except for current policemen there we haven't found a single lawyer or constitutional lawyer who actually thought that this was a good idea and i think this is something that you can also look into it that you can research yourself i also don't think there was a single federal state parliament um way where they actually had proper empirics um for the state's the state trojan how many devices are we talking about here how often can you actually not access um, data. So if they put facts on the table, that would be very helpful. But it just didn't happen at all. Basically, um, if you look at if you look at the way they essentially justified um, expanding police uh, rights. So, but now let's go to media's race. We have a visual presentation for you, so you can get an overview of what this looks like, and so you can also understand what it looks like in your own federal state. Um, so we want to explain some of these differences between the federal states, even if not all of them. So the lighter ones, so white yellowish ones, are the federal states, um, which you all know from geography lessons anyway, anyway, which have new police laws, either as a draft law or have already decided on those. We have two city states, um, Bremen and Berlin, because both of those states in Bremen they had a police law draft, but there was a political fight about it, but then it was withdrawn, so the police law wasn't um, changed. So this was also partially due to, or this was due to successful protests as well. And you can imagine the parties um, in Bremen present that in slightly different ways, but oh well. And yeah, in Berlin, this is crossed out. Well, Berlin, so far, there is no official public draft and we don't know what's in there yet. But there have been some public statements from the government which basically st said in a straightforward way that they want to be... Berlin wants to be a model state. It wants to create the first liberal police law. And they have grand plans. And we're very curious to see what happens there. As Berlin is, as you know, red, red, green has a red, red, green government. And the only other red, red, green... Um, federal state Thuringia, which for some reason is not on here, but it's the only other federal state that has openly said that it's not going to rewrite its police law um, and it's not interested in including new measures um, and rights to for new measures in its, in its law. So this is not chronologically what we're doing here, but we just want to emphasize some of these differences between the different federal states um, and also kind of go back to what the state of affairs is right now. So we already discussed Northrhine-Westphalia, 
Um, so this law was uh, decided on and voted through on December 12th um, with the support of the SPD, the German Social Democrats, with an interesting justification. So the Social Democrats said that, oh, we've been part of the government for decades now, and now these conservatives are in here with now, but we consider ourselves um, stately politicians. Um, so for five decades, we've been writing police law here, so now we're also going to be part of this. So they're basically saying that at least they're being part of the process. The AFD, the far German far-right party, um, didn't vote and abstained fr from um, the vo from voting. And uh, the entire debate um, about this, they j literally, the AFD literally just talked about um, refugees. Their justification was, um, if you don't have refugees, then you don't have crimina criminals. So, well, you don't have crime. One other thing, North Rhine-Westphalia received a lot of praise for having two hearings about this, which was very unusual, because um, usually you have a draft from government, then you have one hearing with experts, and then you vote on it, or you basically usually vote it through in Parliament, maybe with slight amendments. But North Rhine-Westphalia actually received so much criticism, people really like completely ripped this apart, that they really didn't dare to push it through, and that they had another hearing um, after making several changes. That was really interesting. And um, I also checked, because this is really important to me, so I was in one of these hearings, and I was invited to one of in, to the second hearing. There were 10 people in total, and four of those were policemen. So that means there were five lawyers, myself and four policemen. And imagine that, because when I tell people about this, I really think it's... Um, amazing in some way it's as if they're basically union representatives as if you were talking about a new hospital law and you had um four members of a nurses union um who are talking to you but that doesn't happen in any other area where the people who were affected by a law are involved in such an active way and also are involved in such a disproportionate way in lower saxony it was actually slightly worse but we were in hearings on different days and it was 50 50 so basically there were three days with experts and half of these experts were active policemen of different parts um, of the state and of course they have an interest um, in in getting more rights and in expanding the number of things that they can do legally um, but the, just the sheer number in that they turned up in is somewhat strange and also let's not forget that uh, that's also um, a black and yellow coalition in northern westphalia currently of course the liberals, the f German liberal democrats, also try to influence this somewhat. And through the changes that were, inf like they really bragged about these changes that were ultimately um, made to this law before it was actually voted through in Northern Westphalia. Okay, so um, we're gonna move, did we forget anything? Yes, we forgot something. In North Rhine-Westphalia, some of you may have heard about this, um, and there was this uh, Hambacher Forst anomaly. So this is a very German thing. You can Google it. We don't have enough time to explain it, I'm afraid. Um, remember this because we actually have a we have a video clip later about this. But remember that these activists in this forest who wanted to protect this forest had acid on, on their fingernails. Or put acid on their fingers. Um, that's something that's going to be very important later on. But because you need to do something about that, um, if you need to do so, because you need to do something not only against extremists but also against activists, activists. So Lower Saxony. <laughs> so Lower Saxony had hearings. Um, the law has not been decided on yet because something very interesting happened. Um, the uh, Lower Saxonian Parliament has something like. A scientific service. So there are several lawyers who are essentially employed by parliament um, to give advice to parliamentarians. And so they've looked at what the specific committee for issues of the interior um, and they were asked to turn that into a law and the reaction was basically, oh my god. And they basically said it. Um, they published a very notable document which is publicly accessible where they basically took this apart bit by bit. Mm, and I think one of the um, things that I said earlier about this electronic br ankle bracelets is something that they said where they were saying it is absolutely not comprehensible for us what you want to 
like what which goal you're trying to achieve with these bracelets if you have barely not even an inkling what's going to happen there we didn't know about this concept before but we didn't encounter this um, in any other federal state parliament so this scientific service is considered very proper um, and is very well respected but in this case at least they're holding up the parliamentary process and there definitely were parliamentarians that were not very happy about this um, thanks we just want to mention uh, Rainer Wendt, who was um, invited as an expert in one of these hearings on the same day as you. Um, so obviously they're not um, embarrassed by anything anymore. And uh, again, German, you can Google him. He's part of a police union and he said some very stupid things in the past. So, Baden-Württemberg. Um, they... In December 2017, they actually changed some things about their police law and they wrote some things in there, including the state Trojan, um, the uh, ankle bracelets, um, and now they have a new draft law, but we don't yet know how far that's going to go. But we think that the discussion has changed quite a bit because of these debates and the protests and because of these hearings, so we'll see. So, ah, oh, Hessen. You can say something about that. Ah, well... Hess Hessen. I think that was the first case where there was an actual debate because Hessen is an anomaly, which is why the CCC was very much involved in this. Um, and we have a dedicated website which we try, used to try to help the people who were voting, working against it. So what you, they were trying to do is they were trying to give the state Trojan to a secret service. But now they've definitely included significant new rights for police and secret services in their new police law, which was uh, voted through in June 2018. Um, and there are several statements by experts and also by CCC, which you can read on our website. All of these were very, very critical, but nevertheless, um, they voted this law through, but without the Trojan for secret services. Then we have this black state. So, well, now it's not... Black, it's black, black now since Bavaria voted. They have a coalition now. But in May 2018, um, when they pushed this through, it was an absolute majority by the CSU, the Christian Conservative Party. Um, even though we're low, running low on time, there are two things I think that are important about Bavaria here because they were special in several ways. I think one thing is the preventative custody, which really is way beyond anything that anyone else wanted to do. Um, because in Bavaria they said two weeks, four weeks, that isn't enough. If we think someone is dangerous and we don't even know what we're accusing them of, we should just p put them in custody forever. So they have this endless custody which they created, um, which means you can hold someone for three months if you just suspect them of something and then you can extend it for three months several times. Of course, every time a judge needs to look at it, but there's no maximum duration of this preventive custody included in the law. So we're waiting for the first case of endless custody. And the second case, I think, yeah, this is also, well, Bavaria. So they um, expanded DNA analysis. Um, you may have heard that Bavaria is the only state so far that has introduced this idea that if you find DNA traces, you want to look into those and you want to investigate those. So they want to use those to draw conclusions about the co skin color of that person and about the geographic origin, uh, bi biogeographic origin of that person. This led to a lot of protests. This is a very good website, which I would highly recommend by scientists in Freiburg, um, who are geneticists and biologists, um, which is called WI edna.de, where they um, collected a lot of information about this topic um, and scientifically well-founded materials. So, yeah, that's so much worse than this debate about the state Trojan. So there's a, this website is very scientific, but it's very readable. So if you want to learn something about this in DNA analysis, then I would highly recommend that as well. Okay, next, there's uh, Mecklenburg-Vorpommern. Um, they don't have a state Trojan as part of their law, but at least they have the electronic ankle bracelet um, and an ability to essentially prevent people from being in the state legally. Um, and they uh, had all have all, had all of that since April 2018, and we're expecting further 
additions. Um, Brandenburg, which is a red, red government, so Social Democrats and the left. So they have a law. They're going to have the first hearing in one week, so in early January 2019. But they're already really strong protests. Um, so this is probably going to be voted on in spring. And it's supposed to include a state Trojan, but, well, not yet. And then there's uh, Saxony. Um, you may have already seen there are lots of signs for one of the demonstrations. Um, of course, the, again, there's a group of uh, initiatives that's working on this and uh, working against this. This has been voted through without the Trojan, but um, it has... Uh, oh, no, so the government has voted it through, but the parliament hasn't voted it through yet. Um, but it also includes significantly expanded rights for secret services and the police. But if you want to have a look at the... Um, what this group is doing here in Saxony, then you can have a look at all these uh, posters that are around here. And now we have what we promised you. We brought you an example. We already mentioned this earlier. Oh, we wanted to mention one more thing. We mentioned um, the expansion of uh, basically uh, criminal law in Germany. And in one way, this these revisions of police laws are a response to this expansion of criminal law on the on the national level so maybe not in its essence but generally in its det details and they were not even waiting for what the constitutional court might decide in these questions and now we have this very sympathetic um, minister of the interior of Northern Westphalia. And let's remember what we said in the beginning. The thing that's usually argued is that we have high rates of crime and that we have international terrorism as a threat. And that's why we need these laws, these very drastic, really, intrusions into people's basic rights. And this is the day when Northern Westphalia voted on this law and decided on it. And this is the commentar commentary from their Minister of the Interior. And actually, that parliament does look like that. We weren't quite sure, but yeah, that's what that looks like. So let's try picture and audio. Um, so surveilling telecommunications and messengers such as WhatsApp, that's really important. For example, we do this to determine people's identity because 12 hours are not enough if someone has essentially used acid to get rid of their fingerprints. Um, so we can't just let someone go because ca because we can't determine um, who someone is. That's not that's not a rule of law. What's happening right now? So that's something that should make every everyone feel insecure. Anyone who's somewhat sensible should know that there are hundreds of people who are checked, and for half of them, you can't even tell um, who they are because you just don't have the time. That's impossible. It's impossible. It's impossible to tell to determine the identity of 500 people in uh, in 12 hours because they just refuse to and then you have to let them go. Um, but it just doesn't make any sense. If someone... So just to clarify, this is not the evil state. If someone is arrested, that is absolutely up to you. Um, so if that person names their name and their address, they're immediately free, right? <laughs> so obviously that's not what's written in the law, but just so you have an idea of the level of the quality of the debate that's happening in these parliaments. Um, I was shocked, really. So two weeks before that, I was in one of those hearings and that very parliament and I said that I was very concerned that if you include these measures once that they will be used for other types of people later on and all parties were like ah no 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 you this is all of this is rule of law and then Herbert Roll is coming in two weeks later and he says he wants the use use for everyone for pedophiles hooligans activists activists well this is about these environmental activists that we mentioned earlier there's a second example here that was less than a week later so the same minister of the interior um <laughs> let someone take a picture and a video of him with this new terror vehicle so we couldn't um we couldn't uh keep ourselves from <laughs> we couldn't keep ourselves uh from including this nice comment um because someone asked Someone, 
someone asked on Twitter whether it also had nice embroideries on the seats. Someone who doesn't understand that. So there was a scandal in Saxony where police vehicles had basically right-wing embroideries on parts of their seats. And so then here's also Herbert Reul again. So he was also asked whether he expected that there might be constitutional complaints. And so let's listen to what he said. So might you be worried that someone might sue you in front of the constitutional court with this law? Well, of course, with these laws, someone is always going to sue. And that's why it also it's also smart to write this law in a way that you have the best possible conditions with the constitutional judge. That you have the best possible conditions. So someone always sues. And then uh, as, as if it was completely normal for you to implement in unconstitutional laws. That's an interesting way of presenting the facts and of seeing the world. I've said this often in the previous 10 years. Whenever I discuss, ever since I, ever since I discuss, have been discussing these state Trojan things with politicians and they often say that, the f and I'm, I've often been telling them the first person who breached the constitution was the parliament in these cases. And if they didn't constantly implement co unconstitutional laws, they wouldn't have problems with the constitutional court all the time. I am so upset again and we have three minutes left but now we're coming to our core demands hoping that you're all going to join us in these demands and are going to shout them loudly at the next demonstrations so oh, considering that they're not very concise uh, well um, we'll stick to this and I think we have the better arguments we have even more better arguments um, just because they are called technical devices does that not mean that we are now suddenly agreeing to state Trojans? State Trojans are essentially one way of introducing insecurity into people's devices. And we continue to stand for this idea that the state should not be hacking people's devices. Um, and I continue to hope that we can actually implement this. Um, Secondly, um, maybe bit difficult, not very catchy to shout at a demonstration, which is qu because it's quite lawyery. And there's this term about there's this judicial term about how it's something is highly personal. Um, but we're saying that this is not just about privacy, but it's about your the most intimate sphere. So this is a German legal term. Um, and I personally think that this very personal, this intimate sphere was barely discussed. So this is not just privacy. This is really absolutely protected, regardless of what you suspect someone of and what you're accusing someone of. This is part. This is something in German law that you cannot interfere with. And I think this is not discussed enough. Um, so all of these this is getting more and more difficult uh, in terms of uh, shouting these things. So you need to find alternatives that actually protect people's basic rights. There are alternatives, are obviously, but people are not even talking about these anymore. And whenever an expert tries to bring these things up as uh, alternatives to actually hacking someone's device, um, it's uh, people are basically barely listened to. The, nobody really listens to them. Um, and then lastly, if there's the thing I think that's really depressing is that there are so many lawyers, and there are so many lawyers who are invited as experts. And one important thing is, the one question is also, how can you implement the measures you have in a way that's legal rather than just including technical alternatives? And then one thing we also want to get away from is this feeling-based and fields-based security policy. If there is no evidence that this actually provides further security and safety, then we're not going to implement it full stop. And that's also really what's being said right now. Um, and if you feel that something is going to make you safer, then we also can't do anything about that. And you shouldn't be implementing that unless you have these empirics. Um, good security policies are not just repressive. Um, I think this is also very important for... This is not just the question of... Security politics is not just about what you write into a police law, right? If you, there are things that are insecure, there are many different ways... Um, there are many different ways of making things more secure. So not every social problem has a technical solution, but you need to go into very different areas to find these solutions. Um, and then we have this demand that I think that we don't need to justify in many great ways, but we shouldn't have surveillance without justifications. 
um, even in a technical world, this is not something that should have a future, um, such as biometric data, um, other location data, movement data. These are not things that you should simply, simply record. And lastly, um, we really want to know how much this costs. Everything. Do you remember what this was previously? Oh, I see very few hands. Uh, oh well, we need to do that very quickly. The total, the um, total surveillance bill is something that was mentioned in one constitutional court decision, which basically said the question is how many different kinds of surveillance can be done simultaneously, um, and this is something you can use to counter this argument that it is actually possible to go dark. Um, so basically, it is looking at how many parts of everyone's lives are already being surveilled by in different ways. And in general, this whole idea of having these endangerers is something that we really need to get away from, this whole logic and this whole notion. Um, and we just shouldn't tolerate this anymore, this idea of having preventative, um, preventive uh, laws and measures. So this entire idea that has been implemented for a while and that has been manifesting itself qu for quite a while now. And in danger is a term that's be got, gotten quite popular and that's being discussed and used a lot. And so it's basically based on this idea that there are people who are intrinsically dangerous. That's completely counter to the rule of law. You can't assume that some person is by nature dangerous. Because then, of course, if you think that, then you're going to get to the conclusion that you have to put this person behind bars into custody for all of eternity. Um, and that's something that you re we really, really need to counter. Um, and I think important things like um, indiv the indivisible demonstrations, stuff like that, we can't let them, we can't let people segregate us, but for every single measure, we also need to imagine that we could be affected by that and not just these endangerers. Also, Eons jetzt, um, Eons jetzt Mirko von der Bühne schmeißt. So before we're being thrown off stage, um, so we're also just going to briefly mention Brandenburg because they included explosives in their draft. So they were suppo they are supposed to use be used very carefully, such as hand grenades. So of course you're not supposed to kill anyone or prevent them from fleeing with these weapons. If it should happen, then the exceptions are kids and pregnant people and throwing explosives into groups of people. And then I'm really like, what? Where did they take a wrong term turn? They really can't. They they can't use these war weapons, right, for police. So well, thanks so much for your attention. Um, and just so Twitter doesn't explode after this um, with comments like, oh, my scooter was stolen. There was um, an illegal wild scooter park on this side here. So all of that was moved to this side where the legal parking area is. So now please another round of r loud applause for this nice talk. Um, thanks from us as well. Um, as always, please, you can you can give us feedback on Twitter at.